and a very warm welcome to the Tron Church for our evening service tonight. <clears throat> From the book of Exodus. God says this to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And yet much later, Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Well, let's sing now. O God of our fathers, the God who has always been God of our fathers and of us today, creator and Lord. <clears throat> Let us, let us bow our heads together to pray. I worship none other but Christ. And it's because of him and his wonderful intercession, his intervention into our world of need and sin that we're able to look forward to something new and wonderful 
in the great future. And I'll read some words from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, about that wonderful future. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful revelation which has come to us from you, from heaven, through your servant, the Apostle John, as you opened his eyes to see these wonderful things. And we thank you so much for all that you have prepared for those who love you, for those who belong to you through Jesus Christ. And we thank you that it is his intervention that has caused the death of death, the ending of that terrible last enemy, because he himself bore in his own body on the cross the consequences of our sin, which is death, the wages of sin. And how we thank you, dear Father, that you have opened up for us this great future, and we look forward to it and pray that it will be hastened as we look to you and wait for the revelation of the new heavens and the new earth. We thank you too, dear Heavenly Father, that in that wonderful new, new realm, you have promised to wipe away every tear from the eyes of those who belong to you. Because death shall be no more, death, that great source of tears, and no mourning, nor crying, nor pain. There will be nothing there which will hurt or destroy in that wonderful new realm. We thank you so much that you have the power the ability and the will to make all things new. And so this evening, dear Father, as we come here to worship you and to sing, to listen to your words and to encourage each other, we do pray that you will give us a fresh and deep assurance in our hearts of all that you have prepared. You have prepared things that we cannot really imagine, but the Bible begins to open them up to us. And we pray that that song of triumph and victory will steal into our hearts again and again as we go about our daily business, but as we think ahead and keep our eyes, as, as it were, on the horizon, scanning the faraway places for the return of our Lord Jesus. So bless us this evening, we pray. Build us up in faith. Please especially encourage any here who are bowed down or unhappy for whatever reason. And we pray that our eyes may be fixed upon you and your great purposes. And we ask it all to your glory and praise, and in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is very good to see you all here uh, this evening. If anybody is here for the very first time, uh, we're especially glad to have you here and uh, want to make you very welcome. We will be serving some refreshments directly after the service. There'll be a lovely noise of wheels coming in, and there'll be a trolley that appears here, uh, as if by magic. And, and on the trolley, there will be teas, coffees, Orange juice, red juice, fish and chips, chocolate biscuits. Anyway, there'll be something nice and refreshing. So it's a good chance for us to meet together and enjoy each other's company. Isn't that part of what church is all about, to enjoy each other's company and to encourage each other and build each other up? So do stay if you possibly can at the end. As for things happening this week, there's lots of stuff happening as always. And if you haven't uh, managed to get hold of one of these leaflets uh, this morning, I think we've got plenty of them outside. So do, do uh, pick one up at the end. Good. We're going to sing together again. <clears throat> I think we're in good voice. The Christian faith has always been a singing faith, and that's one of the great joys of it. We can express to the Lord and to each other our joy and encouragement in being Christian. So let's turn in our hymn books to number 100A. 100A. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Serve him with joy. His praises tell. Come now before him and Rejoice, 108.
Well, now we come to our reading from the Bible. And perhaps you turn with me to Peter's second letter, chapter 3. And you'll find this on page 1019, page 1019 in our hardback Bibles. So I'll read again, as I did last week, the whole of the third chapter. The section we'll be looking at later this evening is verses 8 to 13, but uh, we'll get the whole context by reading the whole chapter. So 2 Peter, chapter 3. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But... According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And may it be a blessing to us this evening. Well, we're going to sing together again. Let's turn now to number 19a, which is a setting of Psalm 19. And this, uh, this psalm shows us that the two main revelations of God's truth, first of all, the heavens and the creation around us, but secondly, and even more importantly, God's own words, his law and truth. So number 19a, the heavens declare.
offering for the Lord's work will be taken up, and we have a, a couple of minutes of quietness. You might like to read over again 2 Peter chapter 3, and our musicians will play for us. Let us pray together. We read this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Dear God, our Father, we thank you so much for the compassion and the understanding of the Lord Jesus when he was mingling with great crowds of people who were gathering around him because they felt that he had something to offer them. And we thank you that as he looked at them, his heart yearned for them. He had compassion upon them because he could see that they were harassed and helpless. They didn't know which way to turn. They were like sheep without a shepherd, without principle, without guidance or leading. And so he said to his disciples, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out more laborers to gather in this great harvest. And our dear Father, how we thank you that over two millennia now, very nearly two millennia, there have been laborers who have set out into the harvest field, seeking prayerfully and trustingly to bring in the harvest, to bring men and women and young people, to put their trust in him and to serve him and to give their lives, to be willing to deny self and take up their cross and follow him. We thank you so much. And we're aware, dear Father, that it's still just the same today, that the harvest is very plentiful. There are so many people in the world and so many are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd today. So we want to ask you, dear Father, earnestly, as our Lord Jesus tells us, that you will continue to raise up men and women to serve you and to go out into the harvest field seeking those who are lost and seeking to bring them to Christ. We do pray that you will raise up from our own congregation and many other congregations, men and women who are willing to search, willing to to submit to training, to training as evangelists and Bible teachers, and who are willing to go abroad or to stay in this country, serving you in this great cause. We thank you for the churches in Scotland, which are now much more consciously training up apprentices as, as young ministers and potential future leaders. And we want to pray for those churches, including our own, as these young men and women are being trained in this kind of service. 
And we pray that you will call more to do this work. And for all of us, dear Heavenly Father, give us eyes and hearts for those who are lost and harassed and helpless. And give us words to speak to them, words of comfort, and above all, words of truth, words about the salvation that lies in Christ only and cannot be found anywhere else. And we pray that it will please you to bless this church, this congregation, more and more in the future, and to continue to help us to look outward and to bring in many to hear the words of truth, to come to Christ and to know the joy and the assurance of salvation in him. And for tonight, dear Father, as we open your word again in a few minutes' time, we pray that it will be life to us, that our hearts being hungry and our minds wanting to learn more and to be filled with joy and understanding, that you will give us these things from the Bible and strengthen us in our faith so that we can stand firm, be unashamed, be bold and confident in our witness. And all these things we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Well, let's sing together again, friends. And our hymn now is number 548, a hymn about the Bible. How sure the scriptures are, God's vital, urgent word. The only person who could have written a line like that is somebody who really knows the Bible. How sure the scriptures are, God's vital, urgent word. Well, may that be true of us as well. Number 548. Let's turn again in our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3, page 1019. Now, my title for this evening is The True Shape of History. And as I said earlier, the verses I want to take are verses 8 to 13 in this last chapter of this letter. The whole of the gospel, the whole of the Bible, is about a historical process. And it is this that distinguishes Christianity so sharply from other faiths. Other faiths at heart are all about man and man's behavior. And what they all say, one way or the other, is, here are some principles to live by. This is how to live a good life, typically by things like prayer and giving, fasting, feasting, self-examination, meditation, non-violence, caring for those in need, and so on. Other faiths all have man at the center, and their concern is with human behavior, 
with what we need to do, how to live. Christianity, by contrast, is about what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do in the end. And that is, of course, a historical process. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has a conclusion. It's all about God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the middle, at the central point of his activity, he sent the Savior to redeem and rescue his people. And at the end, he promises to bring his rescued people to share his eternal home with him. The gospel is good news for this very reason, that it is about a historical process. We look back in history 2,000 years to the central events of all history. That is the historical death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And we now look forward in history to the fulfillment of a great promise from God about the future. And Peter speaks of this promise simply and clearly here in verse 13. Look with me, verse 13. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So we are waiting. That's the characteristic position of the Christian. We're waiting for the final events of history to unfold. God has promised something radically new, and we are now waiting for him to fulfill his promise. Other faiths are about man's obligations. Christianity is about God's achievements. Other faiths can only, at best, offer good advice, whereas Christianity gives us good news. Now, in this third chapter of his letter, Peter is dealing with the end of history, the great and final goal of history. And he's dealing with this subject because the young Christians that he's writing to at these churches are in danger of being unsettled in their faith by false teachers, as we've seen over the last week or two. He's told them, do you remember at the beginning of chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 1, there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. Jesus' denial is at the heart of the false teaching. But at the beginning of chapter 3, Peter becomes more specific. And he says in chapter 3, verse 3, scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. And they will say, where is this promise of his coming? So they're not just deniers of Jesus. Specifically, they are deniers of the return of Jesus. They are denying, then, the true shape of history. The Bible promises his return. Jesus himself, himself spoke of it many times in his own teaching. And the apostles, Peter and Paul and John, they speak of it many times in their letters. It is one of the fundamentals of the Christian faith, but the scoffers deny it. You know how sometimes we hear of people these days, even professional historians, who are known as Holocaust deniers, people who have a special and twisted reason for denying what the Nazis did in the Second World War. Well, the people that Peter is writing about here are second coming deniers. Their view of history is warped. They have special and twisted reasons for denying the return of Jesus. But Peter is saying to his young Christian friends, don't believe these scoffers. So I want us to see how Peter teaches the true shape of history to his Christian readers. Now, it's a very different view from the views of history which most people hold today. And broadly speaking, over the last few centuries, worldly thinking has developed three main ways of viewing history, which we might characterize as the cyclical view, the utopian view, and the meaningless view. And I'll try and describe each of these. First of all, the cyclical view, which has its roots perhaps more in Eastern thinking than in Western. The idea here is that everything goes round in circles. So a nation or an empire grows strong, reaches its peak of influence and power, and then declines. Think in terms of the Bible. You have the Assyrian Empire giving way to the Babylonian Empire, which is followed by the Persian Empire, which is followed by the Greek Empire, Alexander the Great and all that. Then the Roman Empire coming and going. Much more recently, the British Empire rose in power st steadily and strongly in the 18th century, reached its peak in the 19th century when nearly half the world was colored pink on the maps. Do you remember? Well, no, you don't remember. <laughs> if we've seen maps published a 100 years ago, it was like that, wasn't it? 
But then the British Empire declined in the 20th century. I guess the Falklands War in 1982 was about the last gasp of it. More recently, the Soviet Empire rose and then fell during the 20th century. And people today are talking about the waning influence of the United States and the rising influence of China spreading its grasp into different parts of the world. Now, in terms of the rise and fall of political power, you can understand this cyclical view of world history. But it's very different from the Bible's view. Then secondly, there's the utopian view, the idea that things are getting better and better and better until finally we shall reach a, a kind of utopia, a state of harmony and peace and perfection. Now, this has been a very pervasive view, and I'd be surprised if it doesn't still linger in many of our hearts today to some extent. There's a Marxist version of it. The Marxist view is that world history is explained in terms of the struggle between the workers and the bosses, between the employees and the employers. And the struggle goes back and forth. Sometimes it goes this way and sometimes that way, but eventually the idea is we shall reach a state of equilibrium and happiness with the emergence of a classless society where everybody is equal. The problem, of course, as George Orwell wittily pointed out, is that inevitably some will be more equal than others. In other words, the desire to get ahead of the field is endemic in the human psyche. But the Marxist desire is to create a kind of utopia, a kind of perfect society. Another version of this uh, view is the idea of the unstoppable progress based on the forward rush of science and technology and medicine. Now, this began to build up a great head of steam during the 19th century in Britain. The Victorians were truly remarkable people, and uh, I can only admire their energy and their vision. Just think of the advances that they made, for example, in architecture and engineering. The rapid construction of the railways didn't start till about 1840, but by about 1870, the country was covered with them. Uh, think of the development of industry, manufacturing, and shipbuilding. Then think of the advances in medicine, the development of good sewage systems, and town planning, and so on. Many of Glasgow's finest buildings were built during Queen Victoria's reign. But there was a genuine feeling amounting to a powerful creed that the dawning of the 20th century would be the dawning of a golden age where disease, war, ignorance, and crime would be eradicated. And for some, at least, of the, the movers and shakers, that was a vision which had a certain infusion of Christianity. Let me read you a few lines from Tennyson, who was poet laureate in the 1880s. He was a fine poet, and these lines are taken from his famous long poem, In Memoriam. And the motif here is the ending of the old year and the beginning of the new year. And he's speaking to the church bells. I guess it's December the 31st, it's midnight, and the church bells are ringing in the new year at midnight, but really, it's not so much the ending of one year and the beginning of another that Tennyson is dreaming about, it's, it's the beginning of a new age. So he's commanding the bells to ring out what is decayed and damaging to society and to ring in what is good and life-enhancing. Here's what he says. Ring out old shapes of foul disease, Ring out the narrowing lust of gold. Ring out the thousand wars of old. Ring in the thousand years of peace. Ring in the valiant man and free, the larger heart, the kindlier hand. Ring out the darkness of the land. Ring in the Christ that is to be. Now, do you see that? The thousand years of peace, the Christ that is to be, it's a kind of millennial vision. A thousand years of peace with Christ ruling the world. And we can be sure that Tennyson was not alone in Victorian Britain in nursing dreams of that kind. But did the 20th century prove to be a golden age of peace and delight? By 1945, when the Second World War finally ended, all such dreams were shot to ribbons. That dream of inevitable progress of a perfected human race living in a kind of global utopia that cannot be sustained by any person today unless they're living with the cloud cuckoos. The human race today is so obviously being ravaged by warfare, aggression, greed for money, pornography, everything else that eats out the heart of mankind. 
The third view is the view that history is meaningless because human life itself is meaningless. Now, this view is part and parcel of an atheistic view of life. If there is no God, it's hard to see how there can be any purpose in anything. If our planet and the life on the planet are simply the random consequence of various atoms and molecules coming together, then random consequences must be the product of random causes. As somebody has said, it is meaningless that we live and meaningless that we die. So as far as history goes, by this sort of view, you can study it till you're blue in the face, but you're not going to find any recognizable patterns or sense in it. As a famous American put it, history is one darn thing after another. This idea of meaninglessness was popularized 50 years or so ago by the plays of Harold Pinter in England and by writers like Samuel Beckett in Ireland. And you may know some of their works. The scenes that they portray typically show people having discussions about things which are inconsequential and quite devoid of any interest or significance. For example, this is a, this is a, a Pinter-style discussion. Where should we go today? I don't know. What's the weather going to be like today? It's going to be rainy or sunny. I don't know, Hubert, but it could be related to whether you had jam on your bread this morning or butter. Now that, Edwin, though I don't mean to flatter you, is a remark of peculiarly penetrating insight. That sort of thing. It's nonsense, isn't it? It's quite funny, but really it's an expression of despair. Nothing means anything any longer. And the even more modern idea that there's really no such thing as truth is directly spawned by that mid-20th century view that human life and history are without shape and meaning. If there's no room for meaning, there's no room for truth. So we have the cyclical view of history, the inevitable progress or utopian view of history, and the meaningless view of history. But over against all these views, there stands the Bible's view, and only the Bible teaches us the true shape of history. The Bible shows us that history is linear. It runs in a line from the creation to the consummation. It is not meaningless, but purposeful, because God determines its purpose. He decides it, and he causes its events. So how does the Bible show God's purposes being worked out in history? Well, the key factors underlying it all are man's sin and God's salvation. Sin and salvation. Let's think this through. God created a perfect universe, and within that perfect universe... He made a perfect world. Then he set mankind in the perfect world so that mankind should rule it and cultivate it. Our first father and mother, however, Adam and Eve, they wanted to be in charge of the world without reference to God, and it's their bid for power, their rebellion, that sets the scene for subsequent events. They sin against God. Now, we mustn't imagine, of course, that God was taken by surprise when Adam and Eve rebelled. God is God, and he knows the end from the beginning. But Adam and Eve's rebellion called forth God's judgment upon them, inevitably. And they, and all their descendants after them, including us, they were placed under a severe sentence. It's all there in Genesis chapter 3. It would now, God says to Adam, it will now be hard for you to grow your food, because from now on the ground will grow thorns and thistles more easily than edible crops. Marriage now will become a battleground, a battle of the sexes, and childbearing will be a business of great pain. And above all, death will now enter the world. Genesis 3 is the point when the last enemy, death, is released. And so men and women become subject to sickness and aging and dying. The human race and the whole environment from now on are shot through with decay. So the entry of sin leads to the entry of death, and the history of the human race becomes deeply disfigured. When you read any kind of history book, you'll find that you're reading largely about wars, bloodlettings, intrigues, and lust for power. But as the history in the Bible develops, so God shows that he curbs, he restrains human fierceness and bad behavior. So he puts a stop to Adam and Eve's tenancy of the Garden of Eden, and he expels them. 
Later, he puts a stop to the universal wickedness and violence by sending the flood in Noah's day. Later on again, he stops the building of the Tower of Babel and he reigns in man's ability to exalt himself. And so it goes on. Evil develops and then God stops it. God stops the cruel oppression of the Israelites by the Egyptians and he frees Israel from slavery. But later on, nearly a thousand years later, he has to turn the tables on Israel because of her wickedness and idolatry and he drives her out of the promised land and smashes the city of Jerusalem as he had smashed the Tower of Babel. The pushing out of Israel from the promised land in 587 BC mirrors the pushing out of Adam and Eve from Eden. God drives people from his presence because of their sin. And these events are only a foretaste of the final expulsion from God's presence of all who refuse to bow to his son. It's man's repeated rebellion that shapes the history of the world. But God is the merciful savior as well as the severe judge. So each of these great and terrible judgments reveals a saving purpose as well. So think of Adam and Eve. Even in the moment that they're expelled from Eden, God tells Eve that finally one of her own offspring will arise to crush the head of the serpent who deceived her. Well, then think of the flood. The flood is an act of salvation as well as of judgment. Many are destroyed. Everybody is destroyed except Noah and his family. The ark contains the nucleus for rebuilding the human and animal populations of the world. Then think of Genesis 11. The Tower of Babel is smashed. But before the end of chapter 11 is reached, we're introduced to Abraham, from whose line the chosen people of God is to be built up. Then think of the exile, when Jerusalem is, is smashed to pieces. Before the exile even takes place, in fact, more than a century before, God announces through the prophet Isaiah that he is going to bring the people of Israel back to Jerusalem. He's going to restore them. Then finally comes God's son, who comes again both to judge and to save. His appearing and his message, when he comes, they split the human race into two. Now the fault line between those two groups was always there, but when Jesus comes, he opens it right up. Some people come to him with joy and submit to him, others reject him. We shall all of us at the end be either amongst the sheep or the goats. And now we're living in the last days, as Peter describes them in verse 3 of our chapter. The days between the first and second comings of Jesus. And this is a period of grace, a period in which the gospel is to be preached to the whole world. But it won't run on forever, because the final act of world history, the greatest and most awesome day of all, will be the day of Jesus' return, when according to our verse 10, the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed or burned up. So the true shape of world history is that it will all end with the return of Jesus, after which, verse 13, the new heavens and the new earth will appear, characterized by righteousness. Therefore, sin and death will have no place there. So with all that in mind, let's look at the points of detail that Peter teaches us here. And I want us to notice three things. The first thing he tells us in verses 8 and 9 is that we can trust the Lord's timing. Verse 8, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now there's a most interesting feature here. Just look back to verse 4 and the aggressive question which the scoffers put. The scoffers say, where is this promise coming? What they're really saying is, we don't believe it, and we won't accept it. But now look at verse 8. What question is Peter addressing here? He's surely addressing the same question, even though it's not actually articulated. He's addressing the same question about the timing, or the, the fact of Jesus' coming, as the believers think of the question. The believers listen to the scoffing of the scoffers and they're unsettled by it. The scoffers say, where is his coming? Ah. And the believers think, well, where is his coming? Maybe the scoffers are right after all. 
And Peter, knowing that the Christians are unsettled, answers their question. But it's the same question. But while the scoffers fire out that question belligerently, the Christians ask it thoughtfully. And Peter helps them by showing them that they can trust the Lord's timing, even if it seems slow. And he's very warm and affectionate towards them. Have you noticed the word beloved there in verse 8? Do not overlook this one fact, beloved. Look back to verse 1. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. Verse 14, therefore, beloved. Verse 17, you therefore, beloved. And even verse 15, our beloved brother Paul. This is not just an exercise in doctrine. Now, it is an exercise in doctrine, but it's much more besides. This is the pastor loving the people deeply and caring that they should understand the truth and be comforted by it. And Peter's message is a great comfort to us today as well. And the message is, verse 9, that the Lord is not slow in fulfilling his promise to return. Yes, nearly 2,000 years have passed since Christ's ascension. But verse 8 tells us what to make of that. 2,000 years is like a couple of days in the Lord's calendar. It's nothing at all. What is two days to you and me? It's like a short weekend. It's like a Monday, a Monday and Tuesday. It's nothing, is it? The Lord doesn't look at time as we do. Peter is saying, don't think that because he hasn't come yet, he's not coming. Of course he's coming. He's going to fulfill his promise. It's a promise, as verse 9 puts it. And look again at verse 13, according to his promise. God doesn't promise what he has no intention of performing. And Peter tells us more about it in verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So this apparent delay is owing to a wonderful motive. The Lord is extending the era of gospel preaching so as to bring more and more people into his eternal kingdom. Paul says something very similar in Romans chapter 2. He says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So both Peter and Paul use this word patience, God is patient, therefore we too can be content to be patient. Jesus himself sheds further light on it in Matthew chapter 24. He says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So friends, we're still in this era of gospel proclamation, so let's keep on proclaiming the gospel. We have good news to share And people are coming to Christ every day in repentance and faith as God continues to exercise patience. But, verse 10, when the Lord Jesus does return, that day will arrive as unexpectedly as a thief breaking in. So this period of gospel grace, extended already for almost 2,000 years, may go on for a while yet. Jesus said to to the 11 apostles in Acts chapter 1, Just before his ascension, he said, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. God knows that timing. He's fixed it. Some things are revealed to us. Much is revealed to us. But some things are kept shut up from prying eyes. And this is one of them. There have been times during the last 2,000 years when groups of Christians have said, We believe the Lord is about to return, maybe next year or in 10 years' time but they've always ended up looking foolish. It's not for us to know the timing of these things, but what we do know is that the Lord is patient and kind and is giving us further windows of opportunity to preach the gospel. So let's trust the Lord's timing. Then secondly, Peter teaches us to live lives of holiness and godliness as we wait for the Lord to return. Look at verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, since it is all going to be brought to an end, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire? So why should Peter write like that? Why should the sudden return of Jesus be an incentive to to us 
to live lives of holiness and godliness? Well, it's because we want him to take pleasure in us when he returns and when we meet him. We want him to be able to say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Just imagine if the queen were on holiday in Scotland and she were to invite you to tea at Balmoral Castle. How would you present yourself to her? How would I present myself? Would I go wearing the trousers that I'd had on while I'd been mucking out the chicken pens? (laughs) I would not. I can tell you I would be all washed and scrubbed up. I'd be wearing my very best suit because I would want to please my earthly sovereign. How much more then should we attend to living godly lives when we're preparing to meet the king of kings? And think of this new home in which we shall be living after his return. It's the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. How could we live in the home of righteousness if we knew nothing about righteousness in our own lives? We would be simply unprepared. The New Testament never exhorts us to live godly lives just so that we can tick boxes and say, haven't I done well? Haven't I kept this commandment of that one? No, godly living is all about our relationship to Jesus. If you love me, he says, you will keep my commandments. Living a godly life means keeping his commandments, and we learn to do so because we love him, and we want to express our love for him. Peter is teaching us to live our lives in such a way that when he comes back with the suddenness of a thief, he will find us living enthusiastically for him. Jesus puts it like this in Matthew 24. Know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter's teaching is making exactly this point. We're waiting for the day of uh, the day of the Lord, and our preparation for this greatest of all days is in learning how to live lives of holiness and godliness. It is a lovely thing to do. Then third and finally, <clears throat> Peter teaches us to be eager waiters. Do you see how he uses this word waiting three times in these three verses? Verse 12 waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Verse 13, waiting for new heavens and a new earth. And then verse 14, since you are waiting for these. So Peter is teaching us to develop in our hearts a sense of joyful longing and expectation. Just as the schoolboy longs for the start of the summer holidays, just as the engaged couple long for their wedding day, The Christian longs for the return of Jesus. We're eager waiters. The person who's not a Christian has a very different sense of waiting. All he can do is to wait with fear and apprehension for the arrival of old age and death. But the Christian's waiting is transformed because of what is promised to us. And what is promised for us in verse 13 is a new home, a new heavens, and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So the contrast between that and this old broken world that we're living in is so clear. In this present world, righteousness is a shy stranger. It puts in little appearances from time to time, and we welcome it when we see it. We're glad, for example, that William Wilberforce, back in the 19th century, worked so hard for the abolition of the slave trade. That was a pushing forward of righteousness. In a different way, we're glad that life in Northern Ireland is better now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. There's been an improvement there. We're glad that mental illness is so much better understood today than it was in the days when you got shut away into an institution for half of your life if you behaved strangely. But the dominant powers in this old world are the powers of greed, dishonesty, and corruption. They're dark forces which hate what is true and good and righteous. As the Apostle John puts it so starkly, The whole world is in the power of the evil one. Even Jesus describes Satan as the ruler of this world. Now, Satan's power in this world is temporary, of course, but he is exercising it fiercely in these last days of human history. And this gives us all the more reason to long for the new heavens and earth 
where righteousness is at home, where righteousness is the character of every relationship, every thought, every conversation, every impulse, every action. The new world where we who belong to Christ will have lost the power to think evil or ill of other people. Righteousness is the native air of the new creation, just as unrighteousness is the dominant force in the old world. In the new realm, it will be impossible for us to hate or to envy or to covet, to despise people or to demean other people. As verses 10 to 12 put it, the old world is destined for fire, the fire that destroys sin and purges everything away. And the new world, purged of everything hostile to God, will appear, and we who trust Christ will inherit it and live in it. So with a new home such as that in prospect, let's not get too attached to our homes in this world. Let's not get too attached to our houses and our gardens because we shall soon be leaving them. We've staked everything on the world to come, and the Lord God has promised us this great inheritance. What is promised to us is something radically and fundamentally new. The old creation will be ended, burned up. As verse 10 puts it, not only will the earth be brought to an end, the very heavenly bodies and the heavens will be dissolved. This kind of teaching is more than some liberal theologians can come to terms with. If you ever hear them talking on the radio about the future, they quite like the idea of improving the old world, reducing its corruptions and enhancing its virtues, a little bit like the poet Tennyson with his 19th century view of progress. But Peter and the whole New Testament with him is teaching the end of the cosmos as we now know it and the ushering in of a completely new world. So friends, let us wait for this with eager anticipation. Let's end now by listening to a few other voices from other parts of the Bible who are all encouraging us by getting us to think with longing about this great future. Isaiah 65. I think it's in Isaiah that we first have this, this phrase, the new heavens and the earth. Isaiah writes, well, it's God speaking through Isaiah. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. What, <clears throat> what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. It's by revelation from God that we come to grasp these things. We couldn't possibly work them out by scientific experiment or by logic or philosophy. But God opens out to us the prospect of all this because he loves us and because he wants to assure us of what lies ahead. And then here is Jesus speaking to his apostles in Matthew chapter 19. This is not a very well-known quotation, but it's tremendous. Truly I say to you, he says, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Just think about that word, the regeneration. Isn't that a great word? The word that Jesus uses there literally means the again genesis. So the true shape of history, determined by God, is linear. It will come to an end, gloriously and yet terrifyingly, when Jesus returns. The curtain will be dropped on this age, and the new age, the new creation, will begin. So Peter assures his beloved, his Christian friends. Verse 13, according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Well, let's bow our heads and we'll thank God. Dear God, our Father, we haven't seen this and we don't have eyes to see it at the moment. But we regard your promise 
as something upon which we can rely absolutely. And our prayer is that you will fill our hearts with an ever-growing joyful expectation for what lies ahead. We do pray thy kingdom come. We pray that the Lord Jesus will return, that his return may indeed be hastened. And our prayer is that you will give us the unspeakable joy of seeing him face to face, our Savior, and of bowing before your throne. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's turn for our last hymn to number <clears throat> 973. 973. Lovely hymn by Robert Murray McShane, who died at the age of 29. Did you know that? 29. But a great servant of the Lord. When this passing world is done, when has sunk the radiant sun, when I stand with Christ on high, seeing all life's history, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Number 973.
As we stand, let's listen to the final two verses of the Bible. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen.